Yeah, Rocky, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to come and uh, speak to your people. Uh, you know, you're probably looking at the most unworthy and most unlikely guy that gets to do what I get to do. You know, the Lord's allowed me to speak in about 150 football teams. And um, I've s spoken in school assemblies all over this country. I've spoken in prisons all over this country and around the world. And uh, I, I, I don't understand it. I don't understand why. But God, but God, if you will allow him and allow the transformation of the Holy Spirit to empower you to do things far and beyond who you are, just let him. Turn it loose and let it go. Now, we're going to do something kind of crazy right now. I hope your preacher will be okay with it. It's football season, and I know how you are. You know, screaming and hollering at the football games. I was a football player myself. Diane, crank that video up on my phone. I want everybody to stand up. Yeah, crank that video up. You're going to need to get this. And I'm telling you right now, when I get ready to do what we get ready to do, you better be a lot louder here than you would be at a football game if Carolina just scored or Clemson or whoever you are. But I'm for Jesus, all right? All right, now listen to me carefully. You got to follow instruction. I'm going to say, y'all a bunch of cheerleaders, man. Give me a J and you'll repeat it. You got it? And we'll go through Jesus and we're going to live. We're going we're gonna to rock this place for Jesus. Are you ready? Give me a J. A. E. 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 S. S. U. U. S. E. S. What you got? Jesus. What you got? Jesus. What you got? Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Holly. Well, I tell you, it's hard to get over that. I love to, I love to give Jesus all the glory. Let me start with a little verse over here in Acts chapter nine. You know, he's probably a lot of a lot of our heroes and. Um, Beginning at verse 1 in chapter 9, you're familiar with this. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest, and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogue, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. And suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. We'll zero in on verse 6. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? Are you ready? Said out loud, Lord, Lord what, what would you have me to do? See, so you got to mean it. You can't just say it, you got to mean it. You got to be willing to absolutely sell out to the King of Glory 100%. You understand? In 2004, when I nearly faced death. I had a heart attack and it was called the Widowmaker. Now listen to me carefully. When Dr. Whittle met with me, he said to me, by the way, I've had three heart attacks. If I fall over dead, don't worry, come up and finish. 
It was all about Jesus. You hear me? And uh, my wife understands my craziness. And uh, Dr. Whittle says, do you realize what's happened to you? And I said, well, they tell me I had a heart attack. You had the Widowmaker. You know what that is? I, no, sir, I don't know what that is. The clock's not on, so bear with me. Anything can happen when a clock's not on. And uh, he took a piece of paper and he drew it out and explained to me what the Widowmaker was. He said, let me explain it this way to you, son. Stack 10 men up. If they've got what you got, nine will die and one will live. And he said to me this, I'll never forget it. And he said, son, let me ask you a question. This is a doctor talking, not a preacher. And the doctor said, do you believe in the sovereignty of God? That's what he asked me. And this was in 2003, right before I went out on my own in full-time evangelism. And it struck to the heart core of me. And I looked at him, and I was dead serious. And I said, I believe absolutely in the sovereignty of God. And if you'll get me operated on and get me out of here, I'm ready to go finish my course on whatever he's called me to do. Amen! You got to be willing. You got to want it. You got to desire it. You got to go after it, whatever it may be in your life. But Jesus ought to rank number one. Amen? Amen. It's like fourth and one. Hey, there's about two seconds on the clock. We got time for one play. If we don't get in, we lose. Hey, I'm calling on you, big man. You look like you could move a tree. I'm going to come right behind you when I run this ball. You hear me? <laughs> we're going to score. Some way, we're going to score. Amen. And this is the way it is. Well, look at it. Lord, what would thou have me to do? It's coming from a 10 year alcoholic. You see, I thought having a little drink and socializing with the people would be fine, and I'd be fine and dandy and okay. By then, I'd already risen to a two-time most valuable player as a high school quarterback. I'd won the batting crown twice in baseball. I thought I was on my way. I had, letter, I had letters from Carolina. I had letters from Duke and North Carolina and letters from small colleges like... Uh, Presbyterian and Newberry to go play football. And what happened? I, I, I lost the love of the game because I fell in love with sin. I fell in love with alcohol. I fell in love with doing things I'll have no business in doing. Some of you are in that same boat right now. You're doing things that you said that you would never do. You're letting things occupy your mind you thought you would never let occupy your mind. And you walk away sometimes sad because you've not let God deliver the steel punch of God within your heart. You've not cried out and said, God, I'm yours. What do you want me to do? I'll tell you what he wants you to do. Get saved. Get washed in the blood. Get filled with the Spirit of God. And then begin to become a full witness of His out of the marketplace. Amen? Amen. Did you know they're lost and dying out there by the thousands and thousands? And who's going to reach them? If the church don't reach them, who is? I never forget. I was in Nicaragua, which I've been... 40 mission trips down there. My wife and I built churches there. We have built ten, uh, nine churches so far, getting ready to build our 10th church. We drill for water in the poorest of the poor. And I was there, and they asked me what I preach in the uh, tippy top of prison. And I agreed. And they said to me, Will you cook them a meal? I said, Well, how many, how many, how many am I going to speak to? And they said, well, we're going to put you in a cell with 76 of the most notorious prisoners we have. And he said, the rest of them will be locked up somewhere else. You bring enough food for them, which I did. And I agreed to speak to them. And when I went in, it's kind of rough when you go in there with 76 of them. You know, uh, and, and you got some food. You better hope it lasts for everybody. It may be trouble. But the warden stood behind me, five guards to the right and five guards to the left of me. And the warden called him in and they sat down. 
I looked around and I asked uh, the Lord, and I said, is there a restroom? He said, yeah, that little hole in the wall, right, hole right over there, that's the restroom. I said, that's your restroom? Oh. Where's your shower? He said, you see that PVC pipe coming out? Just get over there and crowd up and get you a shower. I said, we're in prison now, aren't we? He said, you in prison, son. You know what happened to me that day? The most incredible thing happened to me. I realized what sin could do to a person. Those guys didn't wake up wanting to go to prison. Those guys wake up, they, they had a life. Some of them had families. Some of them had children. But they found themselves in a prison. And it's a suffering prison. It is hot. You get one meal a day, one cup of coffee a day. And I stood up ready to preach. And boy, I, I thought, well, boy, I want to give them something. And the Holy Ghost spoke. Listen to me. You know what our problem is a lot of times in the church? We have become so church-minded. We've become so automatic at what we do. We forget there's a Holy Spirit who wants to lead us, guide us, and direct us into the fullness of the things of God. You understand me? I started out one way, and the Spirit of God came upon me and said, Don't go that way. He said, I want you to speak about your mama. My mama. So I began to speak about my mom and how Jesus changed her life. And then I began to speak how I broke my mama's heart. And I became disgustingly sinful and shameful to my own family and to my mom and my daddy who worked hard for me to achieve and to, get, to make it ahead in life. And I spoke to these men with that way. You cannot raise your hand in a prison or they'll, they'll begin to see who you are. So you have to figure out how to do things differently. So they're all seated and they got their legs crossed and they're like this. I said, if you want to invite Jesus in your heart, just lift your finger up and put it back down. I didn't count and I didn't look. The warden did. Out of the 76, 27 of them raised their finger to receive Christ as their personal Savior. You understand me? It's hard to follow Christ in the prison. But we speak in Morganton, North Carolina prisons. We're in Spartanburg prisons. I've been in South African prisons. I've been in Nicaraguan prisons. But I'm going to tell you something. Guess what got them there? Listen to me. Young people, sin got them there. It's a destroyer. You can't play with it. You have to run from it. You have to be full of the Spirit of God and be willing to give yourself wholeheartedly to the gospel of Jesus and to Jesus that he lives in your heart, occupies your heart, lead God and direct your life. You have an intimate relationship with him. You can't wait to get up in the morning to study his word and to pray and to worship him and just have a spell every morning with Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You missed a good point there to give some praise to God. Hallelujah. One of the reasons is because we don't seize the moment that's put before us. We let the devil blind us, and we don't seize the moment. Paul seized the moment. What would you have me do? Peter fell time and time and time again. But when the Spirit of God came upon him, 3,000 souls were saved on his first sermon, and then 5,000 later on another sermon. He was filled with the Spirit of the Most High God. I, be, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. It's a reasonable service. Don't be conformed to this world. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Don't be conformed to this world. Don't masquerade and be one way here today and then tomorrow something else that is not becoming to Christ the King who lives in your heart. But how are you going to change that? It's become transformed. You become totally indoctrinated in the things of God. You study to show yourselves approved. A workman need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen. 
I am the way and the truth and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 6 and 44, no man comes to the Father except he be drawn a wooing and incubation by the Holy Ghost of God. You're going to make decisions today. Some of them are going to be critical. Some of you will make decisions today to follow the King of glory. Some of you will decide today, I'm tired of playing the games. I'm tired of camouflaging my life and being one way, acting another way. Some of you, listen to me, some of you need to absolutely take your wife by the hand and gather here and recommit yourselves not only to your marriage but unto Jesus before it's too late. I've been married 50 years, and I can tell you this right now, they, there's a lot of stuff goes on in marriage. And you have to learn to yield and do a whole lot of things, but you first better yield in prayer and yield to the Holy Ghost and don't do nothing until you've heard from Him and then you respond and everything will be fine then. Amen? It's Amen. the way it works. You young people are faced with unbelievable things, a lot more than I was faced in my coming along in my sports career and all. You need the Holy Spirit. You need to seize the moment. You need to really decide in life what you're going to do and what you're going to be. And don't wishy-washy with it, but go after it with everything that you've got. I can remember I fell so short of the glory, so shameful, so of everything that I had, that I succumbed to the alcohol, not, not in my wildest dreams did I think that I would go 10 years of alcohol. I did not believe that would be my life after my father had executed my life in such a way and made me be so committed, so devotion, so disciplined in everything that I did. And all of a sudden, I became undisciplined in my life. And it cost me. You ever felt like dying? You ever felt like giving up? You ever feel like what in the world am I doing? How did I get here? We've learned to play the games. We've learned to play the games. We've learned to yield over here to this and then yield over here to this. And I yielded myself to the demons of hell. It's hard to believe sometimes what we get ourselves into. I never forget this after I Lost everything. Failed at everything. Total, absolute failure. My little wife, just horrible, horrible to her. She's my high school sweetheart, but she stayed with me. In the 10th year, I didn't want to live. I just, I run out of steam. But one man, after I'd taken a job at the Regency Health Spa, a weightlifting place, I took him around the conditioning floor, and he, he said to me, I, I, I know you. And I said, oh, Mr. Grant, how would you know me? And he said, uh, he said you're Junior Walton. I said, well, I am. And he said, oh, I've watched you play football. I know exactly who you are. And I said, man, that's amazing. He said, yeah. He said, I, I saw that legendary run where you were tackled five times and didn't go down and crossed on the 62 two-yard run that beat the opposing team by one point. Boy, my head got about that big, and it just fell over. And I said, you know anything else about me? He said, he said well, that's enough right there. So he done hooked me. And they want to start taking me out to eat, and he'd pay for everything, so I enjoyed that. Man, I, I said, Mr. Grant, can I get a foot-long hot dog here at Ricky's? Yeah, eat two of them if you want to. And... Uh, Back then, I weighed a stout 210, 215, you know. Today, I weigh 152. So there's a little bit of difference in uh, what's happening to me. You ever love people so much that you saw their life was going in the wrong place and they were under great pressure like I was? You ever just love people so much that you would be willing, 
like Mr. Grant. Mr. Grant took a football picture of me, pinned it on a secondary bedroom wall, and told his wife, leave me alone. Don't bother me. When I'm done, I'll come out. And Mr. Grant fasted and prayed 30 days over my soul. He wouldn't tell me. I never knew it until he died. And then his widow lady came and wanted to have lunch. She said, Junior, my husband loved you like you cannot believe. He would pray day and night and day and night. And I would hear him in there screaming to the top of his voice for God to do something in your life. My husband would not give up. He would not give up. On September 6, 1975, my phone rang. Hello? Hey, it's Mr. Grant. I want you to do me a favor. I said, sure, Mr. Grant. What would you like for me to do for you? He said, well... I know you're a man of your word. I just know that you are, and if I tell you, you will do it, right? And I said, absolutely, Mr. Grant. I went that hook. He was pretty smart at 62, and I was pretty dumb at 28. And he said, uh, okay, I want you to go to church with me tomorrow. Oh, my Lord, church. <laughs> Why, well, I hated myself. I hated church people. I hated everybody. I didn't believe, even though I'd gone to church as a child, went through the formalities of everything that a lot of times we go through as a child. But I had one little trick I was going to try to move on him. Mr. Grant, tell me the church that you're going to, and I'll be sure that I'm there to meet you. Oh, no, no, Junior. I couldn't do that. I'm going to come pick you up and take you with me. <laughs> Let me take another drink of that Budweiser I've got, because I had one in my hand at that time. I was still drinking. Whew. Well, he come to get me, but he was late. He was late. He figured something out. I was too dumb to figure it out. I got in the car, fussed all the way to Arch Street Baptist Church in the Spartan Mill Hill community. He was late because when we got there, all the back rows in the church were filled up. <laughs> he knew what he was doing. I looked around and I thought, oh, good Lord, what am I going to do? I eased up kind of a little bit further and I saw my friend Wayne Cassano and I said, you think you could scoot over and give me a little room? He looked up at me. He was a lineman. He said, we're like sardines, Junior, going down front. <laughs> you ever felt like a million eyes was looking at you at the church? They all knew me there on the mill hill. That's where I grew up. And I started to step in. Three rows back, started to step in, and Mr. Grant pulled me back and said, uh-uh, you need leg room. Get here on the edge. <laughs> and he stepped in. I was, I was too dumb to figure it out. What was he doing? And I'll never forget, Rupert Guest came out and all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He said, that's a lot of you, he said. I thought he was pointing at me. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But God commended his love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Have you got your name written in the book of life? He said, I doubt many of you do. You're probably on a church roll or in a baptismal roll, but you hadn't got your name written in the book of life. What is that? And I said to myself, he said, Revelation 20, 15, whosoever's name is not written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Sweat started running down my face. I thought, oh, dear man alive, I never heard such. He's blazing fire up there. He's blazing talking about Jesus. Well, the meeting ended. I'm having a little talk with God. I said, now, God, 
Uh, you know me. I've cussed you out every way you could be cussed. I've done a whole lot of bad things, and I'm sure you know it. And but if if if, if, uh, if there's some way you you could do something for me today, well, Mr. Gaston got up there, and now he's calling for prayer, and he's ending the meeting. And I said to him, I said to God, please don't let it, don't let him do this. Don't let, uh, do something to him. Make him pray. Do something one more time or call for the music one more time because I need to get right or I'm a dead man. Those are my last words. Pastor Rupert guessed about his head and about 10 seconds went by. No word would come out of his mouth. See, God has a plan for you. God has a purpose for you. He'll move mountains. He'll move rivers. He'll change anything to get to you. And then all of a sudden, he said, Ladies and gentlemen, saints of God, I cannot pray. I have been nudged by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit has told me to extend the altar call that someone in this congregation is facing death. And about that time, the arrow of the Spirit of the Lord split my heart wide open. And I cried like a baby. I didn't believe in crying, but I cried like a baby. He said, you need to get your sins covered in the blood of Jesus. And I'm telling you, I was a sinner of sinners. Nobody wanted to run with me. No friends, even the bad ones didn't because I was so horrible. I don't know how my leg got out there. My leg got in the aisle, and the next thing I know, I was down in the front. And the preacher, Rupert, said, what have you come for? Well, I started telling him all my sins. And he said, no, 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 don't tell me all of that. <laughs> We're going to talk to Jesus about that. What have you come for? I said, well, I need Jesus. What you're talking about? And we knelt down, and he popped that old Bible open and started talking to me about Jesus. And I'm telling you, Rocky, Matthew 3 and 11 took place on me, the third part of it. He baptized me in the fire of the Spirit of God when I cried out to him on that altar. I don't know how to explain it. I don't know how, what happened. But as, as a blazing fire athlete as I was, and I always gave it my all in practice, in the summer events, I... I I didn't know how to quit. I hit the hardest I could hit. I never tried to run around nobody. I tried to run through them and over them. Somehow the Spirit of God came upon me, and the fire came in and went out, and I was never, ever, ever the same. God literally transformed my life on September 7, 1975. I stood up crying like a baby. I was in a Baptist church, but I threw my hands up and started praising God. And I, I, I wasn't sure if I was supposed to do that or not. I, you know, and it's okay. I was squalling. Two voices spoke over here. Excuse me. Excuse me. And I looked, and it was my two alcoholic brothers. My two alcoholic brothers just collapsed and said, We need Jesus. love you and then on the left came two girls they were crying it was my two sisters they each had alcohol problems and they received Christ as their personal savior my father in the north and south Carolina boxing hall of fame 62 fights 48 wins 28 knockouts stepped out from the back row and jogged all the way down to the front and said, I've come to receive this Jesus that my family has just received. And our family was never the same from that point on. Jesus absolutely transformed our life. We had kind of, my last name is Walton. We had a Walton's Mountain experience while we were there. You understand that? Ye that are thirst. Come and drink of me, said Jesus. 
Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. This he spake by the endowment and power of the Holy Spirit. That's what we need, church. All across this place. And we will fulfill Acts 1 and 8, and we'll become witnesses for the King of glory. They won't be able to shut us up. Our tongue will come ablaze to brag on Jesus everywhere we go. You got to know that you know that you know that you're saved. This is not a wishy-washy, I think so, I hope so, I'm trying to do the best I can, and it won't work. It does not work. Your heart's got to be full of Jesus. Would you bow your head and close your eyes for a moment? I want you to really ponder it. I want you to really ponder what you got. How many of you would say, you know what, I, 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 I've got some, I got some problems in my life. And I, and I got some things I'm dealing with right now that are pretty horrible. And to be honest with you, I, I, I really need to. I need to get rid of them. I need a, I probably need, I need to be washed in that blood. I need these things that are occupying my mind, my life, my heart. The sin that is, it, it just, it keeps creeping in now and then. And, and I, I need to get rid of it. I need to be away from me. How many of you would be willing to raise your hand? All heads are bowed, eyes are closed. How many of you would be willing to raise your hand and say, that's me, would you pray for me that I'll get really straight with God 100%? Come on, raise your hand and say, who are you? Get them up high. Come on, get them up high. Don't be ashamed. How many of you would say, if I died right now, I am not 100% assured that I would even get to heaven. I, 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 I'm just not assured of it. But I want to know today, I'd like to know today, that Christ can forgive me of my sins and come into my heart and save my soul. Would you raise your hand? How many of you would like to know that right now? Come on, get your hands up. All right, look at me. Just you strictly that got your hands up. Listen to me. I had to do the same thing. I had to get up and I had to come to the front. I want you to come to the front and we want to pray for you. Would you do that? Let's everybody stand and you that raised your hands, come on forward. Come on forward now. Young people, come on forward. This is, this is your moment to seize this incredible moment, to seize this hour, and your life be totally, unequivocally changed for Christ. I've spoke to thousands and thousands of young people. I've seen them on football teams give their hearts and lives to Jesus. This is your moment and your hour where you come. Keep coming. Keep coming. I want my sins forgiven. Go ahead and see. I want my sins forgiven. I want to be washed in the eternal blood of the Lamb of Calvary. I got stuff for, hey, listen to, listen to me. You that are married, we got trouble. It's not bad, it's just trouble. You know what you need to do. You need to set the record straight and come here, hold that lovely bride. And you as a man tell her, I've, I tell you right now, I'm coming to surrender my life to Christ totally. And I'm telling you, I love you and I'm willing to lay down my life and die for you as a family and come united as one. And when you do, it revolutionizes the whole family unit. The extended family units are never ever the same. Hear me, church. You're never too old to get it right with God. I'm not gonna linger, but listen to me. Somebody here is in a battle. Somebody here's in a battle and you're just waging war saying, man, I need to go. I don't know what they'll think of me if I go because everybody thinks I'm okay. Well, I wasn't okay and I had to go. You need to come. While the music plays, this is a great time to seize this moment in the name of Jesus.